and the Israeli Philharmonic Orchestra is coming to town. Danielle Spivak is on the show. She's the CEO of the American Friends of the Israel Philharmonic, and she's going to share some of the beautiful history of Israel's incredible symphony. This is the Weekly Squeeze, episode 52, and I am your incredibly talented and humble host, Hanala Music, coming at you. Did you hear the news? Guess who's coming to town? No, it's not Uncle Moshe and the Mitzvah Men. It's the Israel Philharmonic. Yes, they are coming to a town near you. If you live near New York, or if you live in Florida, if you live in Los Angeles, San Francisco, West Palm Beach, and Cleveland, and yes, in Carnegie Hall, you will be able to attend the show and see one of the most incredible orchestras in the world, and I've seen them, Israeli musicians, the best anywhere performing in America on this phenomenal tour, the United States Tour 2022. And I am very excited to invite Danielle Ames Spivak. She's the CEO of the American Friends of the Israel Philharmonic. And she's going to be here on the podcast to discuss the tour. Hi, Danielle. Hi. Where do I have the pleasure of speaking to you from? You look like you're somewhere sunny and warm. Well, it's surprisingly warm. It's not typically warm. I'm in beautiful Vancouver, British Columbia, where I grew up. Wow. It's 70 degrees in the middle of October, but I'm leaving today. I was here for Sukkot and Sukkot Torah and all that. So how does Danielle from Vancouver get to the Israeli Philharmonic Orchestra and to the Weekly Squeeze podcast? I, I just told my audience, Uncle Maishi's coming to town. The Philharmonic, the Israeli Philharmonic is going to be in a neighborhood near you. So dish out, please. I First of all, thank you so much for having me. I follow your show and I also am a big podcast fan in general. I love audio. So no surprise, I guess, that I work with a musical institution. (laughs) We're really excited that Israel Philharmonic is going to be back in the United States in November. It's the first time since early 2019. Our tour was delayed, as you can imagine, for three years now. It's our first tour with our new dynamic music director, Lahav Shani, who is 32 years old and the first time an Israeli has been music director of the Israel Philharmonic. I know. I looked this up. The first director was an Indian. He, he directed the orchestra for 60 years, including some amazing highlights that I want to talk about. I mean, I looked at the history of the orchestra. It's just as an Israeli, I, I, could, I soaked it up. I mean, Albert Einstein's in the mix, the Holocaust. I mean, the Philharmon- Israeli Philharmonic is just legendary to the state of Israel. That said, <laughs> um, it's, been, it's been a struggle for you guys over the last you know, two years, especially because, like you told me earlier, your target audience is all over the world and sometimes hard to reach. So how did you guys decide to take the orchestra on the road for this American tour? Okay, so oh, I love everything you asked and I have so much to say. It was really interesting during COVID actually is that we saw audiences emerge from places we never imagined because we increased our digital content. So people were really using our music as a source of inspiration and light during a very dark time. And we were one of the first organizations to do one of these online digital galas pretty early in 2020. And it got cyber hacked, which even got more attention. And it was in the press. And um, we got this outpouring of interest around the world. So it became clear to us that from a audience trend perspective, there's never been a time that people are craving music more than now. At the same time, we know that people are ambivalent about returning to regular life, especially the type of concert going crowd that traditionally would go to an IPO concert um, in America, at least. In Israel, you see every age. Everyone goes. Everyone goes. Teenagers, everyone goes. In America, it's always been a little bit more, you know. Upper class, mature audience. Yeah. I'll tell you that I grew up. My grandmother is from Russia. She's a Chabad woman and she lived in Crown Heights her entire life. And surprisingly enough, I remember all the years that she listened to classical music in New York on the radio. And she listened to so much of it that she could identify the conductor of the song, like they would play the piece and then the radio host would say, well, this was uh, Bach, Beethoven, whatever. And my grandmother would say, conducted by Shkansky. And I would be like, how did you know? (laughs) So we grew up with a deep appreciation for classical music. 
do you have a sense of why, you know, I have an idea of why, but did you realize or think about why it meant so much to her at the time? Or I think classical music serves a very important uh, purpose for the human psyche. I think that music in general is extremely important for our lives and that, you know, classical music is such a beautiful example of what music can do to your soul and to your heart. And to have people take the time to professionally play it and present it in the way it's supposed to be presented, it's, it's, truly, uh, it's truly a gift. So I absolutely agree that it's important for all houses to play more classical music. You no, know, I, I, like you, grew up in a family very involved and committed in the community and in Jewish life on a regular basis. So I've been in a lot of Jewish situations, so to speak, over the years. But still, it never gets old when I'm in a concert hall, wherever we are, in Cleveland or L.A. or Chicago, and the IPO comes on stage and they perform Hatikva to audiences of Jews and non-Jews and all types of Jews. And I think, where else do you go today that all these different people are gathering seated next to each other in a space. What you're saying is that there's this incredible um, power of unifying that, that's happening at the actual performances, aside from obviously the essence of the music itself. Like this, this orchestra on its tour is going to bring Jews together in a way that they haven't experienced in a long time. Jews and non-Jews. You know, listen, you know we have a Hasbara problem, right? And if you think, where else can you go where... It's not about the negative. It's about the beauty that Israel can offer, the ingenuity and the talent. Now, we know about Startup Nation and we know so much is going on in tech in Israel and entertainment. And yes, you know, you can watch Fauda on HBO or whatever. But the idea that this is a physical place outside of Israel in America that we can gather together and celebrate creative freedom and talent and artistic expression And realize, you know, we're all more similar than we realize. We're all creatures of God. We all live in this earth together. It's a very powerful, moving experience. And you hear, you see everyone listening and hearing to the Hatikva together. Um, It feels a lot more unifying than almost anything you read about or, you know, you hear about in our divided world today. I totally agree. I love that. I love that music brings us together. Can I just tell you my connection with the orchestra? Because today I was like, I need to make a connection. Tell me your connection and then I'll do my spiel about the history. Well, besides the fact that, and I want this, we must must explain to the listeners, besides the fact that the orchestra was founded by a Holocaust survivor who gathered a thousand of the best musicians in Europe and brought them to Israel. I mean, besides that fact, I mean, my, my grandmother's a Holocaust survivor, is that Andrea Buccelli performed with the Israeli orchestra. What, what, what are we calling them? The, I, the IOP? You can say the Israel Philharmonic um, or you can say IPO. IPO. Okay, sorry, IOP. <laughs> it's late at night here. The IPO. So besides for that little piece of information, um, on top of it, Andrea Buccelli performed with you guys this past summer when he was in Israel. And my sister, who is a professional photographer in Florida, she photographed him and his family right before they left. Oh, wow. That's an amazing connection. I, I actually was leaving Israel the day of the performance. And so I missed it. And it was incredible. Was it an outdoor? Well, that just goes to show the caliber of the IPO that has Andrea Bocelli, who has performed with the most exalted orchestras of all time in modern history. You know, if he's playing with the is the the Israeli Philharmonic Orchestra, and it's a great performance, that goes to show that you'll get your money's worth when you buy a ticket in Carnegie Hall. <laughs> he, totally. I mean, we're actually going to be releasing a documentary in a few months around the same time that the the public Hollywood maestro movie on Leonard Bernstein comes out. Our documentary is going to focus on the relationship between Leonard Bernstein and the Israel Philharmonic. Not many people uh, know that it was such a strong relationship. He was um, the Nobel laureate conductor of the IPO for over a decade and traveled to Israel many times. And his strong Jewish identity really was channeled in his relationship with the Israel Philharmonic. 
And since then, like you mentioned at the beginning, Zubin Mehta was our music director for over 50 years. And when he retired, Lahav Shani was appointed. But the orchestra was actually founded before the State of Israel was created. It was founded in 1936 by the leading violinist, um, originally from Poland, but he was famous all over Europe. His name was Bronislaw Huberman. And he realized that the cultural life of Eastern Europe was going to be annihilated, that all the best musicians were being fired from the major orchestras, symphonies. Anyone who's read any historical fiction about, you know, the the pianist from from Warsaw, you know, they, there were so there was so much talent snuffed out over the Holocaust. Just another level of the deep loss that the Jews suffered. And for someone like this Bronislaw Huberman um, to still, you know, gather these a thousand musicians together and bring them to Israel. I mean, it's such a powerful story of, of, of rebirth and of perseverance. He was such an important figure at, his, at the time that in this film, which is available on iTunes, it was produced, I don't know, over five years ago, go now by Josh Aaron's, um, sorry, Josh Aaronson. It's called Orchestra of Exiles. It tells the story of Bronislaw Huberman. Um, and I recommend everyone go watch it. But a part of the film, you see how he did blind auditions because he knew all these musicians personally and he knew the decision would mean life or death. So he arranged with his own money visas for over a thousand people, the musicians and their families to go to Tel Aviv in 1936. And they performed um, on a hangar at the port in Tel Aviv in, in December of 1936. Arturo Toscanini was a very famous conductor who was very an anti-fascist and and was invited by Huberman and came to Tel Aviv to conduct the concert. And these were all refugees. They knew that they were literally fighting and fleeing for their lives. And, and they performed so beautifully. And I did my homework. The ovation at the end of the night lasted over a half an hour. Mm-hmm. And there's some great photos of that original concert. People were on roof. People couldn't get tickets. It was so sold out and packed that they were on rooftops in neighboring buildings to listen. By the way, if you're listening, if you're listening in Florida, you can go to the Arsh Center, which is one of the most beautiful theaters. I know this because my husband does events there and you can go have this experience in HD. So, you know, we'll put links, but yeah. It's a wonderful opportunity. Okay, so let's let's go on because the history just is so amazing. The connection between the Israel Philharmonic and the country of Israel, the state of Israel, the land of Israel, the people of Israel. So how does this guy Zubin Mehta, an Indian, end up the director, the, the conductor of the orchestra for most of its existence? Okay, so in 1948, we were renamed the Israel Philharmonic because we were the Palestine Symphony Orchestra before there was a state of Israel. And we became the Israel Philharmonic renamed by David Ben-Gurion when we played Hatikva at the Declaration of Independence, which should give you chills. It gives me chills every time I say it. And the original recordings of that day, you know, include the Israel Philharmonic performing. And Zubin was a very young conductor, um, but very talented. He had been with LA Phil and performed in New York and many other places. And his decades-long commitment to the Israel Philharmonic you know, wasn't just a professional commitment. His connection, his nurturing, his mentorship with the musicians, his commitment to music education. During his tenure as music director, we founded Keynote, a music education department um, affiliated with the Israel Philharmonic under our auspices that it educates over 30,000 kids every year. Just for people listening to understand what we're saying here, he was a, he was born in Bombay. He was a complete 100% Indian who became an honorary citizen of Tel Aviv. The chances of him becoming the conductor of this amazing orchestra and continuing to be the conductor, you know, the entire time. So it's just such a phenomenal story. Again, another amazing story about this, the the, the mazel of this orchestra. It's, it's incredible because even today, so Zubin actually returned, even though he's no longer music director, he, he can conduct it earlier this year again. And world-class artists from around the world are parts of our annual seasons in Israel every year. World-class artists, Jewish, non-Jewish, mostly non-Jewish. But what the orchestra has the power to do is demonstrate that when we work together, And when we can create beauty together and bring out good and uplift a land and uplift a people, uplift peoples, because we know the diversity of the state of Israel, we're only better off. And so, you know, there's a lot of people today that are more ambivalent to get involved in politics or even to get 
involved in religious context. But there's something really interesting that the arts are really accessible. They seem more, I guess, humanistic to people. And so it's an entry point. And so whoever you are can find a place. I just have to throw this in that I once heard the Palestinians play with their orchestra and they didn't get the same talent as the Israelis did. I'm just saying, I'm just putting that out there. <laughs> it's actually our dream to have a music, you know, there's actually the Buckman made a school um, at Tel Aviv University and uh, we were in Aspen this summer with one a music student from Nazareth, an Arab Israeli student who's there, and um, and we have a great ensemble that plays with Keynote, our music education department, and it's an ensemble of Arab Israeli musicians and Jewish Israeli musicians that play together. Fascinating. I have yet to see them perform, but anything that brings people together is always good, so long as they don't try to murder each other. <laughs> Certainly not in the middle of a performance. <laughs> Of course, and you've seen the famous photos from Beersheba and the concerts during military time and Zubin and, and Leonard Bernstein did that as well. But Zubin going and conducting for the IDF soldiers and the concert also that Zubin did um, when Gilad Shalit was being held. So there's a lot of incredible history, Amazing. but we hope all of Amazing. you are going to assess this November in real time because I don't know when they're going to be back. I have to be honest with you. It's getting harder and harder to tour hundred and plus members of an orchestra around the world. So let me give people the the flat out information so they can just go from here and get their tickets or spread the word or send their parents, aunts and uncles, you know, a WhatsApp saying, hey, listen to the Hanala podcast because she's talking about this incredible opportunity that we can have and it's a once in a lifetime opportunity. So if you go to the AFIPO.org website, you can get all the information. You'll see there that, um, the orchestra is performing in California on a couple of locations, West Palm Beach, Miami, Cleveland, New York, Carnegie Hall. Um, there are tickets available. El Al Airlines is the official partner for this 2022 U.S. tour. And that it's going to be magical and powerful and emotional and beautiful and well worth all the effort you make to get yourself and your great grandmother to the show. It's a great date night. It's a great date night, unless you're married to a Sephardi. I'm married to a Sephardi. He doesn't, he doesn't do this Ashkenazi music thing. I once went with him to a, to a Sephardi orchestra, like a Middle Eastern Israeli orchestra here in Israel. And I promise you, I became that wife who in the middle was like, I am Ashkenazi. I am not enjoying this. We are going home. <laughs> but he loved it. Maybe, maybe there's so, some limits to bringing people together. I don't know. <laughs> You're right, Danielle. Well, one thing's for sure. You're a busy mom. I'm a busy mom. And nothing works better in the home than cranking up music and just drowning out the kids. So we're, whether you get to the orchestra or not, make music a, uh, a, you know, play music in your house and make it important in your in your home. It'll only enhance your life. Danielle, thank you so much for being here. If there's anything else you want to add, by all means, go for it. You want to sing a little something? <laughs> I have a terrible voice, but I do want to say, if you live in a place you cannot come in person, we have a ton of content online. So on the website, AFIPO.org, we have children's content that you can play for your kids too. The goal is that we bring the orchestra to you wherever you are so it's accessible. So please check it out. Amazing. Danielle, thank you so much for being here. Good luck.